so much uh, for joining. I will jump right into the presentation. Um, today's topic is uh, the most common proposal mistakes or mistakes in proposal writing, um, because um, we think that obviously it's very important to focus on the positive, telling you how to do things, but often it's easier to learn from mistakes. So if you look at mistakes that others have made, maybe you can um, think about what you have done in the past. Maybe you will recognize yourself in a couple of those points that I will be mentioning. But um, it's easier, in our opinion, to learn from, from mistakes because it's like a lesson learned. You can apply it, you can adjust, and you can avoid those mistakes in the future. So um, that's why we have chosen this topic again. Um, we will have plenty of time dedicated to questions at the end. Um, today's presentation is a bit shorter so that we have enough time um, to answer your questions. And so if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A box. Um, don't use the chat, please, because it's difficult for me to find the questions in the chat. They always get buried in other messages. Um, so please use the Q&A box um, and put your questions in there, and I will have time in the end to answer all of your questions. Um, so just a quick recap of the things that we've already talked about last week. What is a proposal? The project proposal is a document that should entail all the information needed for someone to decide if the project is worthwhile to implement. So you put together the project proposal to send it off to the donor and um, so that they can decide if they want to fund you, if they want to fund your project, um, or maybe if you need to make adjustments or maybe if it's not a good fit. So that's basically um, what a proposal does. Last time we have um, quickly talked about parts of the proposal and also the role of the proposal in the application process. So what it does is uh, it helps you to plan strategically. When you write a proposal, it forces you to sit down, to write down all the activities that you want to implement, to write down a budget, to um, write down a timeline. So it really, really helps you to put together a very clear picture of what you need to implement your project, to do the work that you want to do. And um, with this information, you can also feed your fundraising strategy. That's what we talked about a little bit in the first webinar. Um, how the strategy is kind of the center of the entire proposal cycle and the strategy helps you to understand what are your needs in the future, how you want to address them and which are the steps that you have to take to go there. And proposals play a vital role here because like I said, when you write a proposal, you have to sit down, you have to figure stuff out, you have to spell things out um, and you have to become very clear on what and how you want to do things. So that's why we say proposals help you to plan strategically. There's a couple of things um, that you have to keep in mind when, um, God, I'm gonna, oop, I'm gonna go backwards. Um, before submitting the proposal, that's what we talked about in last week's webinar. So you don't wanna submit right on deadline. You wanna really spell check. You wanna have all the necessary documents, et cetera. Um, those are things you do want to really pay attention to the guidelines because you always want to submit proposals that are 100% aligned with the guidelines um, that donors give you. So you do need to think of all those things. But um, at the same time, there's a couple of uh, syndromes, as we call them. Um, we've made up um, some names for them. So maybe that way it's a little bit easier for you to remember um, and to keep them in mind of kind of systemic things that sometimes go wrong with a proposal. So those are not the small kind of more or less easily fixable things like doing a, a better a proofreading process or um, a, organizing the process better that, that you can apply in the beginning. Those are systemic issues that proposals sometimes have that are really important to address though, because if your proposal suffers from any of these syndromes that I will be talking about, then your chances of success are low with, with donors who recognize those syndromes. Sometimes you can hide them very well, but still then you, there will be pro uh, problems resulting during the pro uh, project implementation phase. So you really wanna have an open eye and really find out if your proposal um, has any of these ailments, um, if there's any of these things that you should fix strategically like on a systemic 
um, uh, from a systemic viewpoint in your approach to proposal writing to make your proposals more successful. Maybe you can also look at the past and think about proposals that you have submitted in the past and think if maybe some of these proposals suffered from these syndromes and how you could maybe fix it or change it. So we will start with uh, Cinderella's sister's syndrome. Um, maybe you know the story of Cinderella. Um, she went, she, she was the, the stepsister that um, wasn't, didn't have all the makeup, didn't have the beautiful dresses, but she went to the ball anyways. And the prince really liked her when she left, um, she left a shoe and then he came looking for his dream girl with a shoe. And Cinderella's sisters, um, tried to fit into the shoe, but they couldn't. Um, so this syndrome describes proposals that try to fit into a box, but they don't really fit into the box. And then it doesn't make any sense. So um, sometimes we also call that mission creep to some degree. If you see a proposal or a call for proposal, or you find a foundation and you think, ha, I really want to work with them. Maybe it's not 100% a good fit, but I really want to try. And you try to fit your proposal into that shoe, into that box that the donor provides. But to be honest, it doesn't fit, then that's an issue. Sometimes it, it looks like you made it fit, um, but in reality, it still doesn't. It also um, refers to those projects where sometimes people change their own projects their own approach just to appease a donor, just to try to fit within that program. And that is also a systemic issue with proposals. That's what is called mission creep, um, is when you kind of um, miss, like when you kind of leave your own mission behind to um, appease to a donor, to just find someone who would support you. And if you change your own program too much, then that becomes an identity problem for your own organization. So if you, um, this sometimes happens with those very, very um, systematic programs like the European Commission or also USAID, they have very specific ideas of what they want to fund. And because the funding is so attractive, because it's high sums and it's um, it's a good network, good support, long time support. NGOs sometimes try to do everything to fit within the things um, that those donors uh, want to see. So they kind of change their own approach. Sometimes they um, yeah don't include specific things anymore just to be able to receive that funding. Sometimes they refrain from. Um, whatever, dealing with human rights, if that donor doesn't want that. But if that's part of the core mission of the NGO, then that's an issue that is trying to make something fit that doesn't fit. Um, and you should try to avoid that. In When you do your donor research, you really have to be careful that you find foundations that are truly a good fit, where you don't have to change um, your programs, your project, you don't have to change who you want to work with, you don't change the approach that you want to use, um, but you can actually do your work and become a long-term partner to that donor to help them ful to fulfill their own mission. So this uh, transfers back to the donor research process. This happens when the donor research didn't really identify the perfect fit, but maybe a fit that just kind of looked good. And then once you've made the decision to apply, you have to try to make the proposal fit. And that's that's a big problem because that nobody will be happy with that. You will not be happy because it's not the kind of work that you want to do or can do or are capable of doing. Your um, The project participants are not going to be happy because it's not what you promised. The donor is not going to be happy because probably you can't fulfill what you said because it wasn't um, actually what you wanted to do or could do. So this is a dangerous situation for, for everyone and should be avoided. So don't try to dress up. Uh, don't try to fit within a box that is not your box. Sometimes you have to decide, even if you already started the process, sometimes you will find out, well, this is not for us. Um, this is not the perfect fit for us. So we will have to find another partner. Then we have the second syndrome, which we call spaghetti syndrome. 
And maybe you know that, um, yeah, I don't know, it's some kind of advice. I've never tried it, but I've also heard it before that people say when you cook spaghetti, um, if you're not sure if they are good, you just take some and throw them at your fridge. And if they stick, they're good. If they fall down, uh, they're not cooked yet and you have to keep uh, boiling them for a bit longer. Um, and we use this um, synonym or this word for it because in some proposals, it feels like um, people are yeah, um, bo boiling something up, trying different things and throwing everything at the fridge to see if something sticks. And if it sticks, great. The rest will fall down, not important. And um, so that results in proposals and projects that are super broad, that have many different strategies, many different um, objectives, many different activities, but they don't do anything really well. Um, they just do a little bit of everything and hope that the donor likes something. And then if they like that one aspect of the, the project, they will also fund the rest because it comes in the package deal. But that's also not a good approach uh, to writing proposals. Obviously, sometimes you will get lucky and you will still you will get funding because the donor likes one aspect of your project. But um, much more likely it is that nobody will fund your project because nobody sees really where your focus is and nobody can see what you're really good at. And that's what you want to show in a proposal that you are a specialist for something. So you can't um, if you want to, if you're a small NGO and you work in the education sector, you can't say, oh, we want to work with primary school, kindergarten and secondary school and high school. And we also want to do a little bit work for university students. Um, and we want to do things in school and after school and every, and, and we want to build a school as well. And we want to train teachers. And we also want to work with parents. Like, something will probably stick if you will find many donors that fund one aspect of all of those ideas. But if you propose a project that broad, um, probably nobody will really bite because what donors want is that you show that you are very good in one area and you probably are because no organization works like that either. Um, usually you focus on either one target group, one uh, area of work, one specific sector, um, that you focus on and that you are good at. So again, this makes also sense in the context of proposal writing, that you focus on the stuff that you're good at. You focus on the stuff um, that you really want to do in a project proposal and find the perfect donor for that. That might mean that the donors you identify, the number of donors is much lower. Uh, you will find, if you just look broadly for education, you will find many, many donors. But if you just look for primary education and programs after school, then maybe you will find just five donors, but those donors will be much more likely to fund you. So don't try to throw everything you have at the fridge and see what sticks, but really do the work, apply for the things that you really want to do, that you can do, that you know how to do, and that you find a great donor for, uh, because that partnership is what is going to carry you long-term as well. And um, that partnership will be extremely beneficial for you in the long run. Then we have the next one, superhero syndrome. I think maybe I have to change this picture because I think the Hulk maybe is not a, a classic superhero. <laughs> uh, maybe I should use Superman here. Um, because what we refer to here is that sometimes um, NGOs describe themselves like a superhero. They think, I think the, the, the concept or the reasoning behind that is, is some NGOs think that they have to, to claim, they have to say that they can do everything so that the donor will like them and, and fund them. But in reality, most of the times the donors know the situation very, very well. And if you claim something that you cannot do, that is very clearly impossible, then you will not get funding. So trying to paint your organization as a superhero saying things like um, you, you aim to, yeah, to solve hunger everywhere and um, you have done amazing work and you're so great and your organization has done this and that and everything is amazing um, is maybe not a great idea because um, yeah, donors will question that 
and um, it doesn't look too good. So just be realistic. Um, usually when you have superhero syndrome, this also reflects not only in the description, but also in the uh, monitoring and evaluation, in the um, objectives, in the indicators that you use. So often projects or proposals that suffer from superhero syndrome promise things like 100% um, school attendance. We've briefly talked about that last week. Um, when you have a monitoring and evaluation system and you, you say there's, there's a, a value where you start, um, the baseline value, and you have a target value, you always want to, that value to be realistic. You don't want to claim something that you humanly can't reach. So attendance levels of 100%, for example, are not possible. Um, maybe if you have one school on a lucky day, but across the year, you will never have 100% attendance rate because kids will get sick. Kids will, uh, one kid maybe just doesn't want to go. It doesn't matter how well you educate the teachers, how amazing the school building is, maybe they just don't want to go. And there's not much you can do at some point. You can obviously get everybody into that school who's interested you can get everybody who wants to go, but you will not get up to those 100%. So if you promise 100%, the donors will either tell you, well, that's not realistic, you are not a superhero, or they will say, well, that sounds great, do that project, and you will fail because you will not reach 100%. So then you're setting yourself up for failure. And that's, again, not what you want to do because even if you run a project and everything is, is amazing and everything is great and you get up to 99%, which would be a, a huge success um, for a project to get 99% of, of students attending school, but it would still be rated as a failure if you had claimed 100, you will reach 100% before because those target values are what your project will be um, rated against. So don't um, promise something, don't promise to solve every single problem or everything 100% or too many things at the same time. Don't promise that one project will set, solve every economic problem in a community or will solve every um, human rights problem that exists in this community. Just realistically explain what you want to do, how you want to do it, What's your approach? What are your limitations? Be honest about them. What are risks and assumptions um, connected to that? And um, how, um, yeah, how you want to go about it. So um, don't claim to be a superhero. Um, just tell them who you are, how you do the work, and be realistic. Because that's, again, either you will not get funding at all if you claim too much or you are setting yourself up for failure because you will be rated against um, that, those, um, those expectations that people have from you. And um, yeah, if you set them up too high, then you won't be able to fulfill them no matter how great your project, no matter how well the work you, you've done um, was implemented. Then we have the doing without achieving syndrome. Um, so that refers to some projects that um, propose many, many activities, but um, the activities never are really, really connected to an objective or a goal. Um, so it just looks like busy work a little bit just to, to um, Obviously, it's not busy work, but it just uh, on paper, it looks like it because it's, just, it's very similar, same activities, and um, you're never really reaching a goal. So the problem here is um, that maybe the project that you are proposing is not 100% clear about its goals and its objectives. So maybe you have to go back to the planning room, to the planning meeting, and really discuss again, what do you want to achieve with this project? What is your goal? Um, what do you want to see happening in the community after you finish the project? Um, what are the changes that you want to see, etc.? So if you are not 100% clear on that, then obviously um, you will also not be, not be able to achieve that because again, 
if you don't know where you want to go, it's extremely difficult to get there. If you just have, um, if you're thinking of, of a project plan as something like a roadmap, um, if you don't know where you're going, then you're not getting there. You kind of need a direction. And clear goals and objectives are your direction. Um, and if you if you suffer from this doing without achieving syndrome, um, then probably you're not clear enough on your goals and objectives. So one thing to, to find out, because sometimes you don't see that yourself, but if you give your proposal to some someone who's not working with you, who's not working on the project, um, then, um, and they tell you, and, and you ask them to read your activities, read um, your proposal, and they are not 100% clear uh, about where this is going, then that's a good clue that maybe you need to be much clearer on uh, goals and objectives. Because if that is not clearly explained, and again, this goes back to your justification, no? why is your project necessary? And then that transfers into what you want to achieve. Um, if that is not 100% clear, it's going to be very difficult for a donor to understand uh, why he should fund you. Um, because if, if none of your activities um, have a clear goal, have a clear um, outcome, not only output, but outcome, then it's very difficult to, to understand what you want to achieve. And yeah, sometimes um, we see this also in projects that have been running for a while, that um, sometimes you have to reassess your goals and objectives for maybe for older projects that have been, yeah, have been running for a while, that um, you didn't have to to restructure in a while um they kind of then you just do the same thing you've done last year and you do it all over and all over but sometimes yeah it feels like you're doing all these things without without really achieving something so then go back to the planning room go back um to a meeting and um define your goals and objectives and then it will become much clearer which activities you have to implement which strategies you have to use to achieve uh, those uh, those objectives. Then we have the Adonis syndrome, um, which um, we we call this Adonis because in many proposals we see NGOs talking a lot about themselves and praising themselves. It's a bit different than the superhero syndrome. They're not necessarily claiming for future projects that they can solve everything, but they are praising themselves um, in a big way, which I think the idea behind that again, or the reasoning for that is that NGOs think they have to sell themselves or put themselves in the best light possible, which obviously is, is, is true, um, but it shouldn't shift into um, just talking about themselves. So one very practical thing that you can do is, for example, to put the um, organizational profile into the annex instead of into the body of a proposal. We see that quite a lot, that um, we, we open up a proposal and there's tons of information about the organization. Sometimes even the organizational profile is the second um, um, entry in the table of contents. So. Um, there's an introduction, and um, after that, people talk about their own organization. And usually when you send a project proposal, what the donors want to see is what the project is about and not necessarily what your organization is about so much. If you have, if your organization, the setup of your organization or the experience you bring to the table is... Um, really helpful in explaining why the project is necessary, how you want to go about it, et cetera, then you can bring it um, and, and, and mention it, obviously. And like we said um, last week, when you when you do, when you talk in the justification, you also talk about why you are the perfect partner, the perfect organization to implement the project. So that needs to be done, but you shouldn't just talk about yourself um, without without a break. So what in Nepal, I've reviewed a lot of proposals and what I kept seeing, which is um, funny almost, is like a sentence that starts or the proposal starts with um, NGO XYZ with the registration number uh, 12345 um, wants to apply for this project. Nepal is the country of Everest blah, blah, blah. We work here. Uh, we have done amazing work in this community. And it's just focused on the organization 
and and some weird facts about the country. And that's not a good justification. And that's not a good way to introduce your organization. So this, this registration number, I keep seeing that. You don't need that in the introduction. Nobody cares for that number. Often you have to also submit your registration paper. So then if they want that number, they will find it. But the body of the text, every word of the body of the text, you should use to convince the donor that your project is amazing, that your project is worthwhile to implement, that um, it's a great idea to support you and to support your project. So don't waste that on stuff that is not necessary, which like that number or some information about Everest or um, the Kilimanjaro or some other tourist attractions in your country. That's not um, what is important. That's not what, what they want to read. Um, and don't, again, don't praise yourself too much and don't focus too much on yourself. What is important at this, at this stage is the project. They want to understand what you want to do, how you want to do it, um, why you want to do it. Yes, why you are the perfect partner to do it, but not the entire organizational history of your uh, NGO. That is not important here. If they have further questions, they will do their due diligence. Either they ask you or they will visit your homepage. Um, they will check it out for themselves. Uh, and that often is enough. Um, I've seen way more proposals that had too much information about the organization than I've seen proposals that didn't have enough. Um, because if you, I think if you convince a donor with an amazing project uh, and they, they just want to know a little bit more um, information about your, um, your organization, they will ask, they will follow up, et cetera. That probability is very high. So I would always um, err on the side of caution here and not put too much information about your own organization. Then um, we have this just more of the, the same syndrome kind of. Um, so this is when proposals get very boring. And unfortunately, this also happens a lot when NGOs um, just propose the same things again and again, and they don't put any spin, any anything new to the ideas that they propose. You also see that in many calls and in many descriptions of what foundations want to fund and support, you see the word innovation. Often they ask specifically for innovative approaches. But innovation here doesn't mean like um, battery technic or um, something that you have to invent the, the wheel again or that you have to invent something um, techie or like do you have to be an engineer doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, often you can spin your projects a bit and look at them from a different angle, uh, from an angle of more um, innovation, of new ideas. So many of you are using um, modern technology to deliver specific aspects of projects. Like sometimes when you some work with um, agriculture project, but you use an app to, uh, to get the information across, especially after COVID, a lot of those things have been developed. Or you use a computer system, you use uh, mobile-based um, banking, stuff like that. All of that has an element of innovation. You just have to focus on that. Um, so that's often what what NGO, uh, what foundations and donors want to see when they say they want to see innovative approaches. But you also have to put yourself in the donor's shoes about what they get sent. Like we said before, um, sometimes when there's an open call, donors can get 4,000, 1,000, um, maybe 5,000 proposals. And somebody has to read, maybe not all of them, but most of them. So that's a lot of work and that can be very boring. So you kind of want to help them so that it's not always just the same. You want to be the proposal. You want to be the project that kind of is different, that pokes out a bit um, and that is interesting. So you can, if it's permitted, uh, if you have the freedom, you can also use some case studies, just um, change it up a bit or include some pictures um, if there's any forum for that, maybe a video, maybe use tools like storytelling to make it more interesting, to make the donor um, 
feel emotion and be connect feel connected to your project and to your ideas. Those are some things you can do to um, make things uh, a bit more interesting. And again, if you um, if you have done a specific approach, if you've used a specific approach for 10 years and it has always worked perfectly for you, then there's no real reason to change everything up just to have innovation. Um, but then maybe you just have to reframe the way you, you talk about it a little bit to make it more interesting and to, to catch the donor's attention. Then we have the mistake of mistakes that I have um, mentioned a couple of times already. Not paying attention to the guidelines is the major mistake that happens in proposal writing. Um, and yeah, I think that's the mistake that probably 80% of proposals suffer from that get rejected. Um, because either you are applying for an opportunity that you're not eligible for. So um, a donor says we fund projects in Europe and you apply from Asia or um, or Africa or um, the Americas, and um, then you're not eligible. Or you work in education and they work in health. Or you work with um, children and they only work with older people. Um, if you're not eligible for an opportunity, you will not get it. Does so if you. Um, we have this checklist, this eligibility checklist that you can um, download and use. And if you cannot tick all boxes with a yes, then you shouldn't apply, or at least you have to ask um, for some further information first and check with them if um, if you can still apply, if they make an excuse, um, an exception for you, or if it doesn't make any sense. But then there's also um, information in the guidelines like um, formatting, for example. Sometimes they tell you which font to use or which size to use or what the cover page should look like, stuff like that. Um, and I think, while that seems silly in some cases, or there's like a specific form that you have to fill out, specific wording, vocabulary that you should use, why this sometimes feels a bit silly, I think often it's also like a test where they look if you are detail-oriented, if you can um, follow instructions, if you can really find, uh, follow what they tell you. Um, and I think often they think, the donors think that um, this is a reflection of how you would implement the project. So if you are already missing in information in the guidelines when you apply, then they might think, oh, then they will also not be able to really implement the project and to do that well. So, um, Really be careful, print out the guidelines, put them next to your computer, um, work with them, give them to your proofreaders, and uh, don't, don't forget to constantly use them and to really, really follow those guidelines. Yeah, we've talked about that now um, in length. Then um, another mistake that I see a lot of times is uh, not being clear on the vocabulary. Actually, I'm working on a proposal right now for a project uh, in Eastern Africa, and um, it was sent to me by the NGO, and actually there's a lot of mix-ups already in there. So the um, you see a lot that objectives and activities are confused or conflated. Um, then there's information about the actual activities in the part about objectives. And then again, the activities don't are not clear because it's also mingled up or output, outcome is confused. Um, all those things need to be very clear and you need to put the correct information in the correct section of the proposal. If you don't do that, it's uh, you just repeat yourself because you will put very similar information into every field. Um, and um, yeah, it's going to be very difficult for the donor to understand. If you mix up one term, two terms, that, that, that's not the big issue, but the, the, those terms, those definitions, what they do, and I um, should, I think we, we discussed that at length last time in last webinar, in the last webinar, is what they do is they help the reader to understand what you want to do because it, it goes through steps. Like it talks about objectives. What is your overall ob all objective? What do you want to, uh, what is your goal? Sorry, and now I'm even confusing them. So the first comes the goal. Like what is the overall goal? What do you want to achieve with the project? Then we talk about the objectives, which are more specific. And then you move to how you want to do those things. So you have strategies. 
how do you want to go about implementing that project? Do you want to do workshops? Do you want to build infrastructure? Do you want to directly train people? Do you want to raise awareness? What's your strategy? And then you get to the activities. What exactly are you going to do? Um, so what I, what, which training are you going to conduct? What are you going to give to the people um, that work with you? What are the exact steps? So in that, if you write those things down, it's really easy to understand the process of your project. But if you mingle it all up and talk about everything in one spot and then fill in basically the same information into every single box, um, then it's difficult. So being clear on that vocabulary is crucial um, to write successful pr proposals. And we have, um, I've mentioned the ebook uh, in the last two webinars. I'm going to do it again today because we still have the webinar deal open again for today. So if you want to get the ebook to be more clear, because we have tons of explanations there in that ebook about those definitions, what goes where, etc. If you want to um, take advantage of that again today in the um, in this during this webinar, it's available for two ninety nine only. So that's uh, that's a steal. That's um, really much. Uh, it's 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 a really really valuable book that many many people have worked with. Um, so if you want to get it, then now is your last opportunity to get it at that price. So yeah, here we have another example for understanding the terminology. So you need to understand the distinction between a vision, a mission, the goals, and the objectives. If you mix them up, if you if the donor asks you explain your goals and then explain your objectives, and you explain first your objectives, then the goals, that's not a good look. That's not what you want to do. So again, crucial to keep these things um, apart, to know the definitions and um, to know what goes where. The same is uh, for the results. You don't want to mix up the output and the outcome. Um, again, impact, you shouldn't claim at all because it's so long term that it's very difficult for you to claim any any impact of your project because you don't usually you don't have enough data to be able to really claim that a project has a specific impact. Um, so if you can stay away from that anyways, but you have to be really clear on what is the output, the direct result of the project, what's the outcome, which is more midterm. What did the people do with that output? What happened next? But again, do you have to be able to distinguish that? If you put an outcome um, in the section where you're supposed to describe your outputs, then that's confusing. That's not going to be helpful. So you have to be clear on the terminology. You have to be clear on all those terms and what everything means. Oh, well, there's one. Um, Syndrome that is not included here, that doesn't have a slide, but that I want to mention, and it's the uh, too many abbreviations syndrome. Uh, and that also happens sometimes um, when we feel like we want to um, appear like maybe more scientific, or I don't know what, exactly why we do that, but it, it happens to me as well. When I, um, when I talk, I use a colloquial language, and when I write, I, I write much more formally and um, Sometimes we write in a way that we think is scientific, which is precise and everything. But on the first, it kind of it's, it's doesn't have a lot of emotion. And as we talked about before, we do want to convey emotion if somehow possible. We want to, and we also want to be understood. We want to reach our readers. And if it's too many abbreviations, for example, if you have to have like the explanation page next to your proposal and try to understand and read and check again, oh, what does this mean? What does this mean? That doesn't help the reader. Um, that takes a lot of um, the, the flow away. That makes it very difficult. You don't want to do that. Um, so try to use a normal language. Try to obviously don't write colloquial, um, but don't write too sophisticated either and don't include um terms and 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 um abbreviations that are just common to your own organization like if you use um a synonym or like a short form for your own organization then make make sure that it's very clear don't use internal terminology that has to be explained somewhere because you want the people to be able to just read your proposal without having to check a dictionary uh 10 times uh, because that's not sophisticated that's just making it harder and like we said if if there's if you have to read 100 proposals a day 
And in one proposal, you have to check um, the abbreviations all the time and it's complicated and you don't understand it, then you're probably not going to choose that proposal because it's the most difficult one. So don't be that proposal writer, be the one that makes it easy, accessible and in a language that everybody can intuitively understand. Yeah, and with this, um, we already come to the end of today's presentation. I already mentioned the book. Uh, just click through this quickly because we're offering it at $2.99 only. Um, this is a part of the, uh, the table of contents. So you see um, that uh, we have stuff about um, proposal writing in general, the concept node, the letter of inquiry, logical framework. Um, and that's just the first page of the table of contents. The book has over 200 pages many proposal templates, um, many uh, samples. So you can read successful proposals that were sent by others and um, you can get some inspiration from them um, and, and use that. And a, a template that you can fill out with guiding questions so that you have a first draft of a proposal. And again, now it's, I think the link is in the chat. My team just posted it. If you get it right now, you can get it for $2.99 only. Um, so that's a real, steel. We also have plenty of other courses. Like I've mentioned before, we have courses on proposal writing, but also the strategy, networking, um, donor research, or very specific courses like fundraising from USAID, from the European Commission, um, how to write a log frame, stuff like that. So um, if you're interested, please check uh, philanthropia.org. And because um, you joined here, you can get 30% off of any of our courses with the coupon code PFN users. So um, if you see anything that you like that you think is interesting, use the coupon code PFN users and, and sign up uh, for those courses. Yeah, and with that, um, I come to the end. Thank you so much. This was, um, I think, the last uh, free webinar of this uh, masterclass for November, which has passed so quickly. Um, it was uh, really amazing to share all this, um, these hours in the webinars with you. I hope um, you were able to take some, uh, to take enough information out of this. I hope you think this was useful for you as well. Next week, we still have uh, one great thing that I want to invite you to. Um, it's a panel discussion, discussion between Eric and me. Eric has more than 20 years of experience in fundraising and um, has great insights into the fundraising world. And we are going to discuss um, the trends for 2023 and also how the recession might uh, influence what is happening, what does that mean for fundraising, et cetera. So I hope um, many of you will join us for um, that, uh, that panel discussion. I think it's on the 30th, so next Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you will also be informed uh, about this again through email. Yeah, and I hope um, that uh, many of you join us for that discussion as well. So now we still have time for questions. Um, and I will stop sharing and see which, which are the questions that you posted here. Um, samples of good proposals. We have um, samples in the book. So if you want to get the book, there's plenty of sample proposals in there. We also have a couple published for free on proposalsforngos.com. So you can also check that under resources. You will find a couple of concept notes and um, sample proposals that you can read through. And there's a the question, how much should I talk about my organization? Is there a rule of thumb uh, to follow when I'm writing? Um, not really. So when you're writing the organizational profile, I would also limit it to like half a page. Um, but um, there's nothing like a, but a, real, a rule of thumb. I think it's always every text that you send to a donor should be as long as necessary and as short as possible uh, because they don't have time. They don't want to read through tons of stuff. Um, so don't be wordy. Don't fill pages after pages. Try to be succinct and as short as possible. And again, every piece of information about your organization that you put into the proposal, not into the annex, because that the organizational profile should go into the annex, in my opinion. And then you can also add, uh, if you have that, like, um, for example, if you if you are an organization and have work for women's rights, 
and you have women on your board, then that's where you can put that information. Obviously, you can show the chart, the organizational chart, to make sure that the donor understands that you are a women-led organization, stuff like that. But I would put that in the annex usually if it's not like super um, fundamental to the project that you're supposing, because the project proposal focuses on the project, strictly on the project and nothing around it if uh, it can be avoided. Um, so then there's a question about um, how to find the owners for aged care work. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a bit, that's one of the areas that's a bit more difficult because um, often there's, I think there's a lot of funding for children, for youth, um, but then if you get to some groups that are more, that are also disadvantaged, um, it sometimes is a bit more difficult to find funding. Um, when you, one thing, I don't know if you, there are any other organizations that also work in the same field as you do, um, then you can um, also check it, where they get their funding from. Sometimes that a good, that's a good approach. So maybe you can also extend, um, well, you said that you think that, that you use Cinderella sister syndrome a lot because you're trying to fit into something else. That's also, there's a danger in what I'm suggesting now, but sometimes you can also think, but that goes for everything. Also, if you work in hunger, et cetera, there's a lot of funding for human rights. Often that is very specific for campaigning, et cetera. But if it's a bit broader, um, I mean, the, the human right to a life and dignity, that's also a human right. The human right to not suffer from hunger is a human right. So sometimes you can also change that approach a bit and also um, access funding that you wouldn't at first glance think is appropriate for um, a project with uh, aged care work. Sometimes that's possible, but it, it, it's, it's dangerous um, so that you don't try to fit into a box and fall for the Cinderella sister syndrome. And you already said that that happens sometimes. So I think what you do need to do is, is, is invest more time in donor research to find those perfect donors who really do fund in that area because there are a couple. Um, yes, not many, that's true, um, but there are a couple. Um, and sometimes you will find that uh, they say that the descriptions don't say we work for the elderly, but we work for marginalized groups. And often you can say that poor elderly people um, that don't have um, anybody to care, that don't have family and maybe don't have um, any, any pension, et cetera, are marginalized people. So maybe if you also include those search terms, um, you can also find some, some kind of funding, but it is a more tricky area. It's not one of those easy to sell projects, that, that's for sure. Um, if you're not guided on the font type and size, what's the standard that one should use? Um, I think that's a bit, I wouldn't, I would, I prefer um, Calibri or Arial because I like that Times New Roman is completely fine. All those clear cut things are fine. It, don't make it too exotic. Don't use a, a font that you have to download or stuff like that, even if it looks nice, because then sometimes the donors can't open it. So you never want to make it any more complicated than necessary for donors. Um, so use something that is on the top of, uh, of the list in Word. Um, and then 11 or 12 a size, not too big, not too small. Um, that's a little bit a question of personal um, preference. I like it much more when the um, lines are not, um, when there's a little bit more of a distance between the lines, because for me, that's easier to read. But if you have a page limit and not a word limit, then that's an issue. So you kind of have to see, it needs to look nice. So I wouldn't, I would, stick with the size, I would stick with 11 or 12, maybe better 12, um, and the font type, one of the first three ones, like the most usual ones, I think is Arial, Calibri, or um, Times New Roman, I would choose one, choose one of the three. Never um, Comic Sans. <laughs> I don't, it always sounds like a joke when I see, say that, but I have seen proposals that had Comic Sans on the front page. Don't do that. <laughs> That's never a good idea in no circumstances. Um, yeah, so so the book, because we, we work with Teachable, a Teachable 
until recently, until very recently, like a week ago or two weeks ago, didn't offer downloads. So we made it a course. It's the book. It's the same thing. It's just packaged up as a course because we also included all these other resources. So you can download everything. Um, but it looks like a course, but it actually is just a book. So uh, that link that was posted is the correct uh, link, and it will lead you to something that looks like a course page. And from there, you can download um, the book and the 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 um, template and the samples. Um, so yes, okay. This next question says that you've tried a few couple of times to buy it, and the link doesn't work. Um, maybe you can shoot us an email to info at philanthropia.com and we'll figure it out because I can't really say what's the problem there. Um, we see cells coming through, so it should work, but so I'm not 100% sure what the issue is. So if you, you, maybe you can try again. It looks like a course. It probably says course, but it's the book. Um, and if it doesn't work, just shoot us an email and we will try to figure it out. Um, so there's another question. Do you recommend creating a cheat sheet? Um, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by cheat sheet. I, if it's something like a checklist or something like that, with um, then definitely. And you can also reuse some parts of your proposal for the next proposal. You don't always have to. Um, you don't always have to uh, start from zero. When we say that you shouldn't send the same proposals to different donors, um, we only mean that you shouldn't send the same unchanged proposal to different donors. Once you uh, adjust some things and you um, yeah, um, adjust to what the donor wants to see, then that's uh, then obviously you can send the proposal again. You don't have to start from zero. Um, you just have to make sure that the proposal is tailored to what the donor wants to see. Um, and a cheat sheet, if you have like a, a sheet where you can just tick off boxes, et cetera, that's a very good idea. Um, I think we also have something like a proposal checklist um, that you can download um, and uh, that is always helpful. And then the last question is about the recorded session. Yes, you should all get emails um, with the, the link to the recordings of all the sessions that we had in this November in this masterclass. Um, maybe you have to um, click that our email is under the, the safe uh, senders. Um, Last time somebody told me the correct word for that, but you can choose to receive emails from us directly into your mailbox so that are not going to spam. Maybe you have to click that because all the emails should be going out. If you signed up for the masterclass or if you're on our newsletter, you should be getting all those emails um, anyways. And we will send out uh, the link to this recorded session also shortly. Okay, so and I see also the the issue with the book has been solved. I'm very happy about that. Um, it's always a bit tricky. Um, yeah, so if you have any follow up questions, if you need the link again, etc, you can always send us an email. Um, and uh, our email is info at philanthropia um, dot com. Dot org, I think, sorry, dot org. Uh, maybe my team can put it in the chat again because I keep, keep saying the wrong thing. I think it's info at philanthropia.org. Um, so if you have issues buying the book, um, the uh, you can, you can um, yeah, thank you. Info at philanthropia.org is the right one. So you can send us an email there. But one last question popped up, um, information about a list of donors. Um, we have um, talked about researching donors in the first webinar of this series. We have free resources also on our YouTube channel and um, on uh, proposalsforngos.com if you want to learn more about it. And um, we also have a database for donor research, which is called donordatabase.org, um, that you can try um, for one week. It's free, I think. After that, it's paid service to find um, donors. But you can also do your own um, donor research and um, there's um, a lot of resources on our pages about how to do that, like researching like-minded organizations, how to use Google for it, how to use tax forms for it, etc. You will find a lot of information about that on our website. Okay, so I think um, 
that's that for today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, again, I really hope that um, this was um, a helpful masterclass for you. We would love to hear feedback about this um, because this was the first time that we did a masterclass like this um, through, uh, running throughout the entire month. So if you have any feedback for us, if you want to tell us what you liked about it, maybe um, what we can do better next time, we would really um, welcome that. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all uh, in the panel discussion, which will be the highlight um, and the, the ending point of our proposal November masterclass um, on the coming Wednesday. And I think it's going to be very interesting also as an outlook to 2023 so that you know what you can and should do in the future to deal with the current situation um, that we're all having to deal with. Thank you very much. Um, and again, I hope to see you on Wednesday and we'll be in touch through email anyways. Um, and yeah, for now, I will say bye-bye and uh, have a good week.